I'm John Batchelor. North Korea, the nuclear test followed by the missile test. That's a pattern established for quite some time. This is the third nuclear test and more than that, many, many more missile tests during the Obama administration. Lessons learned. I welcome my colleagues, Gordon Chang of the Daily Beast and Bruce Bechtel, an author who has written about security in North Asia during the Kim Jong-un era. And Thaddeus McCotter, my colleague and co-host, is here as well of WJR. Gentlemen, a very good evening to you. Bruce, I begin with you for the hardware here. We saw a test, but a satellite launch at the same time. So North Korea is using the weasel language of claiming this is a space effort. Tell me about the rocket. What is the significance of it? Anything new here and its capabilities? Can this also be an ICBM? Good evening to you, Bruce. Good evening, John. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, The significance of this particular missile is that every single aspect of the missile, the the three stages, how they launch it, um, its trajectory until the very end, et cetera, all of that is exactly the same as it is for a military platform, except the payload. The payload for a actual satellite launch would be this bulbous looking thing that they put on the end of the missile. And for um, a regular missile test launch, it would be either a dummy, um, you know, warhead, obviously, or an actual nuclear warhead or a chemical warhead or whatever that was. So this was exactly the same kind of launch until the very end when they launched a satellite into space as it would have been for a regular missile launch. And the significance of that is that it continues to show that North Korea has now made two successful launches of a two of a three stage ballistic missile platform that has the capability capability to hit Alaska, Hawaii, and the west coast of the United States. Now, there is one more thing that we're looking at for that platform that has not been confirmed yet, and that is that the Iranians and the North Koreans have been collaborating on an eighty ton rocket booster that would make this missile about 60% larger than the previous Taepodon missile that was launched successfully in 2012. That would mean the North Koreans have now launched the largest missile with the longest range ever in their history. Gordon, a very good evening to you. I'm told that this, the Pentagon now confirms the satellite was launched, but that the trajectory of this missile was over Japan and the Philippines. Does that have geostrategic significance, Gordon? Good evening to you. Good evening, John. I think it irritates the Japanese to no end. They even put Patriot missile batteries in the center of Tokyo to show their determination to protect Japanese soil. But, you know, this thing flew so far over Japan that uh, nobody in Japan was endangered. And that was confirmed by the Pentagon because they said that as they tracked this thing, there was no danger to the United States or American allies. Of course, that would include Japan. But what it has done, it's gotten both South Korea and Japan much more concerned about North Korea, much more concerned about China. And now it looks like the South Koreans are going to go ahead with something they didn't really want to do, and that's cooperate with the United States on this Terminal High Altitude Area Defense, or THAAD, system that China absolutely doesn't want Seoul to deploy. But probably right now, the South Koreans are going to go forward. And that is, is that new, Gordon? Is that meant to be a a provocative response? Well, it, it is meant to defend themselves, John, and they really don't have very much choice at this point because the Chinese are not willing to cooperate with the United States and the rest of the international community to rein in their North Korean allies. And so um, the South Koreans are going to do this. They said they don't want to do this. They don't want to irritate the right. Chinese. But they got to go forward because they don't have other options. That is, you have a question for our guests. Yeah, what kind of concerted effort are we going to see from the United States and our allies for the talk about options and what the United States and South Korea may do? But is there any concerted action even possible between say, Japan, South Korea, the United States, Australia, and others to deal with North Korea? and to make sure that Beijing knows that this type of behavior from their client state is unacceptable. Gordon? 
Yeah, I, I think that the things are possible, but they're probably not going to happen, largely because there's a lack of will to anger China. And so we are going to see the Obama administration, just like the, the administration before it, do everything possible to have an ineffective response because they don't want to um, endanger relations with Beijing. This is a mistaken approach, as Bruce will tell you. But, you know, unfortunately, that's the state of play right now, especially with the Obama administration in the last year of its uh, a term. And so clearly they're uh, not going to undertake broad initiatives to do something really effective. Bruce, you have a comment. I do. I, I think that the, the South Koreans and the U.S. are taking a good first step in that they're addressing that, as Gordon said. I think the South Koreans also need to upgrade their Pac-3 Patriot missiles. And I think that they need to add SM-3, as in Sierra Mike 3, um, anti-missile missiles to their Aegis-equipped ships that they have. They have three of those ships. In addition, we should be selling the same technology or giving it to the Israelis because it's very likely that this uh, three-stage ballistic missile technology is going to the Iranians as well, and that'll be a direct threat to our friends in Israel. I want to press you on that, Bruce. Is there any indication that Iranian VIPs were present or in some way cooperated with this missile test? We have not seen that confirmed yet, but the 80-ton rocket booster that uh, the North Koreans and the Iranians were working on, the Treasury Department has already sanctioned uh, both the company SHIG in Iran, which is their main liquid-fueled ballistic missile company, and actual individuals for visiting North Korea. So we have it confirmed that Iranians, even if they weren't there on the 7th, were actually there months, weeks, and days before the launch. Gordon, is there any indication from the Obama administration that they're aware that this cooperation is uh, meant to be threatening? Do they talk that way, Gordon, or do they see this as some sort of business deal entirely separate from the, the threats of the Iranian regime? Well, I think on a rhetorical level, they are not willing to say that this is going to threaten China. But I think, though, on, on a practical level, what they are in fact doing is they are trying to put together this coalition we've just been talking about. They are willing to go ahead and do things that China doesn't like, but they're trying to get China in, and really desperately trying to get China in to cooperate. So. Basically, they're going to do the right thing, but it's going to be their last option. Because what about Iran? Do do the, does the administration want to deal with the Iranian, the suspect Iranian cooperation? Uh, absolutely not. You know, Bruce has been a leader in talking about how the State Department knew about Iranian, Chinese, North Korean cooperation on right. missiles even before it signed up the nuclear deal in July. And basically, they were not telling the American public and the world how bad things were in order to get the deal with Tehran. Thaddeus? And gentlemen, we talk about the Iran deal all we want and how insane and suicidal it may or may not be. The question is, do either of you expect this administration to actually recognize the danger posed by this nexus between North Korea and Iran? Or are we going to have to wait for the next administration to try to pick up the pieces? Or the next, or the next. Bruce? Well, well if I may just jump in on that, gents, uh, this has been a great conversation. Um, I, I think that one of the most unfortunate things about uh, Secretary Kerry's dealings with the Iranians is he's been acting as if the nuclear and ballistic missile programs of Iran are somehow this totally separate entity from what North Korea is doing. And that's just about as silly and naive as you can get. I mean, um, Iran gets all of its liquid-fueled ballistic missiles from North Korea. North Korea has obviously been aiding their nuclear program since around 2003. But that's been completely excluded from the talks with Iran. And what that means is, once sanctions get lifted, we're bound to see this level of cooperation increase at a level even higher than it has been over the past 15 years or so. We do know the Israelis destroyed a nuclear reactor being constructed by North Korean agents in Syria, the stooge of the Iranian regime. Gordon, you have a, re a remark. Yeah, I, I think that the... Uh Eventually, the international community, led by the United States, is going to take some effective action against North Korea, but it's not going to be in this administration, 
And the next administration is going to try to put North Korea on the back burner, as almost every president tries to do. But eventually the North Koreans are going to force the issue. And when they do, I think that essentially we could be in a situation which history will remember. And that really is unfortunate, because we can deal with this because there are things to do, like sanctioning Chinese banks. It's just that we're not willing to do that at an early stage. Bruce, we have about a minute. Uh, Right now, your understanding of where North Korea is in these efforts. You talked before when they have a nuke test, they have a missile test. Are they done on this cycle, or is there another part of the pattern? Well, I, I think I think there's a lot more that can come later. This test was very important because it proved that North Korea is really marching forward with its three-stage ICBM technology. The next thing that we need to, to understand from our intelligence community, etc., is can they put that nuke warhead on the missile? And the missile that will go on, as you know, is probably not going to be a Tapodong. It will be a road mobile missile such as the KN-08. So the next thing to look for is whether or not North Korea or even someplace like Iran does a missile test, uh, a a launch test of something like the KN-08. Bruce Bechtel is the author of North Korean Regional Security in the Kim Jong Era. Kim Jong-un era, Gordon Chang of the Daily Beast, and Thaddeus McCotter, WJR, the great voice of the Great Lakes. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show.